Hello, and welcome to the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind bending world of global supply chain, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Today's guest is Silas Adekunle from Reach Industries, and they're a very exciting startup out of the UK. And they're leveraging computer vision, machine learning, and other sensory capture solutions to increase the efficiencies of observational data collection within labs, groups that are doing research and experiments. There's a lot more to this and Silas gets into it and how they're automating data capture and sharing that information, which is very similar to what we do within supply chains. And we talk about some of the connections there and how we might be able to learn from one another. It also turns out that Silas is this year's 2022 GS1 US Startup Lab Pitch Competition winner. Um, For the last four years, we've been doing a startup lab pitch competition at GS1 Connect, which is our annual user conference that's typically held in June. This year, it was in San Diego, California, and next year in 2023, it's going to be in Denver, Colorado. And this is just a really exciting conversation that we have. It's different than most, but I hope that you enjoy it. And without any further ado, let's jump into the conversation. Enjoy. Hi, Silas. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time with us today. So, I mean, I, I've talked to you a few times in, in a couple of capacities, and I'm glad that we have you on the podcast here. Um, but for our listeners, just tell us a little bit about your background and what Reach Industries does. Sure, um, I'll try and keep that uh, concise. Um, I'm, I'm calling in from the UK, uh, which is where I'm based, uh, but I've spent quite a lot of time in the, in the States, but originally I'm also from uh, Nigeria. And I mentioned that because you know I have a passion for wildlife, I have a passion for the natural world around us. So I take a lot of inspiration from that and try to turn that into technology kind of solutions. So you know, before this business, I'd run other companies before that were in the, in the consumer space. So combining robotics gaming and augmented reality, really something a lot, you know, very fun. Um, after that business, you know, I took a step back and zoomed in on, well, zoomed out rather on our manufacturing process, especially when we had a distributed team that were working across the globe and how they were using video to communicate with each other. In parallel, because of my interest in the life sciences uh, space, you know, my dad was a biochemistry professor. I had some friends that were scientists as well. You know, it started to occur to me slowly that things were being done in a kind of slightly outdated way. You know, innovative field, obviously, but in the science, when it actually comes to some of the supporting technology to augment um, those scientists, I saw a big gap, which was around how data was captured. And I think, I thought it had been done better or there was a faster, more deliberate adoption of computer vision technology. If you look at the manufacturing space or some of these other industries than in the life sciences space. And so that's how kind of the the, the long story short of, you know, who I am and how I got to now. Yeah. And so that is interesting. I, I, the wildlife where you started off there, I'm like, where is he going? And then I'm like, oh, I see where he's coming back, you know, because I know what you do. But to talk about Reach Industries here just a little bit, you know, a little bit more yeah. specific about what Reach Industries does. Yeah, no, no problem. You know, at the core of it, we are building technology to augment scientists so that they can better and faster tackle world problems. Um, as we all know, we, we came through, you know, I think we can comfortably say as humanity, we came through to the other side of the pandemic now. And, you know, at the at the start of that, um, you know, everybody was looking at how they could support and one of the opportunities that was when we did deep dive into this uh, kind of space. And in every science lab right now, we know that um, observation data is the foundation of, you know, scientific knowledge. That is, you see something or you observe something, you come up with an hypothesis. And then you 
you know, uh, test that, you conduct experiments, you capture data about that, and then you, you know, you, you then decide uh, on some scientific interpretation of that data. Now, how that data is captured itself can be quite mundane and laborious, specifically if you're talking about activities that are done in the lab on the bench stuff. So for example, if you look at an, an experiment, a distillation, so someone sets something up, if they wanna capture data about that, they either have to stay there um, to be able to see everything, um, or come back in kind of intervals, or B, especially when they're on the bench stop, if they've got their hands gloved um, and they're using it in a few hood, they then have to stop what they're doing, take notes, or someone has to stand over their shoulder and kind of observe what they're doing and take those notes. Now imagine that compounded across, you know, the hundreds of thousands of labs, you know, these highly qualified uh, PhDs and researchers having to do that. And I thought that didn't make sense given the frontier technology that's available. Um, you could set up your phone to start capturing things. Of course, that then starts to create the problems of how do you make a user experience and you know te technology accessible enough that it's easy for everybody to use. And that's where we came in, which is how can we create a platform that leverages computer vision to make it easier to gather the data that scientists need when things are happening in their lab share that data and better analyze it as well. And that's the foundation of what we do. That's Amazing. fascinating. Ahead, yeah, no, I mean, that's absolutely fascinating that, sorry. It's fascinating that your dog just started barking <laughs> as you were about to ask a question. That's what's fascinating. I've, the timing been quiet that. all dang day <laughs> and now, okay. All right, go back into it though, please. Oh my gosh. So. Silas, it's fascinating what you just talked about. And I can remember way back, right, in school even, standing there next to the beaker or whatever and watching. Now, that was decades and decades ago. So I know technology has moved very much forward. Uh, you'd be surprised no. because it's still kind of being done like that. So our technology is not just for industry. So, you know, there's usually two approach when you're, you know, B2B kind of SaaS business, you... Uh, um, specifically in this in this space, you've obviously got the impact you can have on industry itself and then how things are taught. So it's not just about how science is done, but also how science is taught as well, especially if you look at actually the, the pandemic and the things that came out of that, which is, you know, maybe some remote working or, or, you know, working from home, only needing to be there when you have to be there. So that way you, you, you've just got better res allocation of resources as well. And when you look at education, there was this big kind of situation where, you know, you'd have, normally have international students, for example, and quickly the industry had to scramble to try and see, okay, how do we get this data to, you know, people that might be trying to learn from all over. And in hindsight, I don't know why that technology has, hasn't been there. And especially when you look at science and how it's done. So you have this huge problem called reproducibility problem, which is people tend to, there's all this idea of objective and subjective. People tend to write things in their own way or we develop habits and behaviors. So someone might do something that's very different to the way you would normally do that and just write notes that you then have to interpret. But, you know, specifically when it comes to science, which is about facts, you know, I was quite surprised that the technology wasn't there to capture exactly what happened, when it happened and how it happened. So, yes, you're absolutely right. Our science is done, can be impacted by this technology, but also I was taught as well. So question for you on that, because I'm picturing all these people standing in the lab as part of your development. Were, did you actually go and spend time with students and spend time with scientists learning what their processes were and then how this technology can be used within them? Um, absolutely. So that, that was exactly what we did because, um, you know, from experience of building products and building companies, the first thing have to do, you have to do is make sure your product is right for your target audience. So you have to shadow them. You have to see how they live. Because I'm not a scientist. I've spent lots of time around scientists, which has its benefit, um, you know, not being a scientist, has, has its benefits because then you look at the world in kind of a different way. Or sometimes you're a bit naive and that naivety helps you overcome what would be considered really grand challenges, you know. So we, we bring a different lens to the equation or to the problem with huge respect for the work that's being done. So we spent a lot of time shadowing scientists, going to university labs, watching how things were done. Because 
you know, science is very diverse. You've got biochemistry, you've got, you know, a, a molecular stuff, you've got cell and gene therapy stuff. But at the end of the day, they all have to capture data. And you have, say, electronic lab notes, for example, that people use to capture that data. What we're trying to do here is provide a better tool that's essentially, you know, a, a, an extra pair of eyes, ears and, and brain at the lab to support you, you know, like a, a junior that's there on demand to always be there to be able to capture data for you, watch stuff for you whilst you're away. And so, yes, we had to really step into their world, really live these problems. And then, you know, we start to embody it because at our company now, we've got partnerships with a lot of our pilot customers, but we also have our own in-house labs, which allows us to not have to disturb them when we're doing product development. So I want to take a step back here because you said a few things and I want to kind of paint a picture for our audience here a little bit. One, I want to clarify, you still are technically a startup company. Um, yes, you know, yes, absolutely. Very, very much so. I would really encourage everyone to go to Reach Industries online and to look into what you're doing because the visuals really help. Um, you know, you're leveraging computer vision and cameras in science labs. And it's when I say cameras, it's plural. It can be one. It could be two, three, four, five. Um, yeah. And you talked about um, uh, reproducibility problem. And I remember yeah. this yeah. being back in, in grammar school. I had middle school. I had the most amazing science teacher for two years. He was so tough, but we did labs every day. And it was just like, you know, it helped me out with so much stuff and it helped me out with my writing, um, which I'm still not that great at. But um, <laughs> but you, to your point is that you had to write it in a way that people could reproduce it and get the same results. Right. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that gets lost in translation. And sometimes humans, we see things a little bit late. Like when did it boil? Did it boil at 30 seconds or was it 31 seconds or was it 32 seconds? And when you get into these things, specificity becomes a real critical issue. And then you also talked about being naive. You've been around scientists, but you're not a scientist. I actually did a training class earlier this year, and they talked about having a naive expert. And a naive expert is someone that's naive about your issues, but could be a user or could be a partner or could be something else. And what happens is this naivete brings in questions that people don't think of. You have ever heard of the saying is you're too close to the problem, mm -hmm. right? And that means you're the expert, but a naive expert could come in and say, why are you doing it like that? Yeah. And when I first saw your solution, Silas, and I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of mic time here, but when I first saw your solution, I'm like, oh my gosh, like the simplicity and the complexness of it at the same time, I'm like, why haven't we done this sooner? Because I'm a car guy. I love cars. I've, I'll take an old car, new car, electric car, ice car, whatever you want. But people often debate today, like, would, would you take an autonomous driving car? And they're mm -hmm. like, well, what happens if it runs out of memory or blue screens? And I'm like, well, what happens if you have a heart attack or a stroke? Yeah, or, exactly. Or if, you, or if you choke, I go, here's yeah. the difference. In these autonomous cars, I have two eyeballs and three mirrors, rear view mirror and side mirrors. Yeah. They have like 15 cameras that can see in the dark, that can see through fog, that, that can judge speed when, you know, I can't judge speed. You know, like you kind of have a feeling like in, in new cars today, yeah. tell me, we all know this and people are going to laugh right now. And Liz, I know you're going to laugh. The last time one of your friends was pulled over for speeding and they're like, oh, officer, I didn't realize I was going that fast because the cars today are so smooth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I'm doing 80 miles an hour and I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, but back to your stuff, Silas. So let, let's let's transition gears here just a little bit. We got to know you through our startup lab pitch competition. How did you find out about GS1's U.S. startup lab pitch competition? So I, I, you know, actually before, before this, you know, full, full disclosure, I didn't heard much of GS1, but our CTO I'd actually heard because of the, the data standards uh, work that, that you were doing. So I think this was both a mix of an inbound and also me searching for opportunities. You know, your early stage startup, you're trying to 
find ways to to kind of surface around key decision makers or, or industry partners that you can align yourself with. So I think that's how the introduction uh, um, came about. And then there's a clear alignment here, obviously, to do with, you know, we're capturing data, GS1, amongst many things, is creating standards to make sure that things are as efficient as possible. So we have, we have an alignment in you know, how we look at the world or the ideal world, that is. Yeah, I'm so glad that because this is it. We, we started this startup lab pitch competition four years ago, and it's about bringing startups to to the world. And it's 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 a bi-directional thing. One, we want to learn about new technologies and how it can help us. And two, we also want to educate um, folks on the use of standards and where they could maybe implement them into work that they're already they're already doing. And, and we're starting to see this. And turns out you actually won first place. Uh, in our startup lab pitch competition, so congratulations to that. And and if you Thank want, you. if viewers want more information, you can go to gs1us.org and find out more about our startup lab pitch competition. I don't want to make this too much about that, but what I found very interesting, and we knew it was going to happen because we have a selection process. There's a committee that selects the startups, and we get to eight, and then the eight go on to the competition, and then we hand out prizes for the top three. But when we look at your product, your solution today, it was very much focused on labs, right? And computer, uh, not computer labs, but computer science, computer vision, leveraging in whether it's an organic lab, a chemi chemical lab, a manufacturing lab, you know, and a lot of manufacturing process. Liz, the other day we were talking about packaging. Packaging has R&D labs. What material is gonna be used? How's it gonna be heated, right? We're gonna be doing these tests and stuff. Well, guess what? Some of our consumer brands, right? They do tons of lab testing on fragrances and taste and all this stuff. So once we made our panel realize like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a lot more applicable, but how does it really tie to GS1 standards? Then it came to what I noticed in interactions when people met Silas and when they talked to Silas, they're like, how can we leverage your computer vision in the manufacturing process where we can watch repeatable processes and, and do things. And there was some nuance there between labs and stuff. So Silas, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that or just validate that I'm not off the mark here. No, you're, you're totally, you're totally right. I mean, you know, to, to, to look at the wider point that you're mentioning, what we're doing here is about augmenting people. And now we're starting in the life science space because there's a lot of impact to be had there and that industry has a lot of catch up to, to play. You know, the next uh, uh, few few decades, biotech is really going to come into, it, into its own. And um, when you look at it from that lens, any organization that cares about, A, you know, um, protecting their IP, having that data structured in a way where they can make intelligent decisions from it and, you know, they, they have... You know, high value, all humans are high value because of our potential. You want to make sure that that potential is not wasted. Then you care about leveraging the latest technology that's available, you know, like computer vision. And this was just one of the industries that was kind of playing, playing catch up. So yes, you know, that, you know, when you look at manufacturing, you've got processes in place, you've got methods that people have to reproduce sometimes. You've got insights that, for example, you know, Lumi can, the platform can see um, a phase separation in a chemistry lab. Let's say you've got a vessel and you've got, um, you know, two chemicals reacting against each other, then they're going to separate. Can spot that before a human does. That changes your understanding of the chemistry and when you thought that was going to happen. And you could take that to so many different industries where innovation is happening if you want to improve those products. So yes, you're correct. We're starting here, but the, we're just really laying a foundation to then be able to tackle lots of other industries. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting to me and, and the possibilities. And Liz, if you think about some of our other conversations, like with Paul Dietrich and Carol with Transmute, and we talked mm -hmm. about verifiable credentials, and what they talked about is with the complexity of the supply chains, we need to replace people along the supply chains with autonomous data capture environments. And I feel that Silas has a play in here with is it going correctly? Is the same repeatable process happening? Or if something broke, was it because the repeatable process broke or something new that came in? And you, you see this when you get into real specificity on like, how many times can the bearing spin at a certain temperature before the bearing breaks, you know, but this is, 
what Silas is doing is that's one component of a thousand components that are all going on at the same time, um, you know, there. So it's very interesting. And Liz, I know you had some other. No, it's really interesting. And, and by, by having a technology measure and help with repeatable processes. And like Silas, you said earlier, it's like an extra pair of eyes to help to support the person. That person can be doing other things too, more value added than taking down a number um, and allowing them to do um, other important um, work that they need to do. So you've already kind of spoken to it when you started talking about how to get the word out there and, you know, when you start shadowing and understanding what the problem is, but what advice do you have for other people like yourself who are entrepreneurial minded and have a big idea and they want to implement it? How would you tell them to get started? Um, you just have to, you know, go, go get it. You have to start from somewhere. And I know sometimes, you know, our biggest critics are ourselves. You just think, you know, I'm not from an entrepreneurial background. I can't do. So my, I studied robotics. So that's, you know, what I really uh, um, wanted to do. I wanted to build robots, you know, and I went to university, wanted to create the kind of things you see in science fiction. And so with my first company, I, I saw that, oh, it was a bit underwhelming, the types of robots that were out there. And you just start one step at a time. So built a prototype, started talking to friends, started interacting with people. And then you discover that there is a gap. But regardless of how far you go on that journey, you will have an adventure. So just start. I would say start talking to people. Anything that you don't know, ask questions. So you find an expert. And when you start talking to people, you bring those ideas to life because that's the way ideas work. You know, if we're talking about science, you come up with an hypothesis, you test it, you get feedback on it, and then you start to tweak and iterate. And, and you know, we, we're familiar with that process, say, in our work lives or our day-to-day -day lives, but not so much when we're, you know, on the entrepreneurial journey. But if you zoom out, everything in, in life is about those little incremental kind of changes and steps. I love that. I love that. I mean, because it really is. It's just go do it. Get, get out there, start communicating, start asking questions, start sharing ideas, you know, and there's, yes, there's right ways and there's wrong ways, but there's also new ways and other ways. And, That's we, you know, I was told, uh, you know, every no is uh, one step closer to a yes. And uh, Liz is laughing because she's like, he got a lot of no's when he asked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, but yeah, so that, that applies in a lot of things, uh, a lot of things. Okay, so um, I want to wrap us up here, and we always ask our, our guests two questions. I'm going to start with the first one, but what's your favorite technology today that you're either using for work or you're using personally or you're just enamored with? What's your favorite tech? Um, so it's going to be a, a, a odd answer, but... You know, so and and I guess maybe there, there's room for that. So I'll start with a non. I, I can't give you just one. So I'll start with a a, a non-conventional one. And I tend to the, the more you go into this space, or if you come from a robotics background, and then you also see where biotechnology is going. You know, we're starting to view the human body as the most complex piece of machinery out there because you know we're used to trying to fix it. If we go to the doctor, things like that. And also then, if it's technology, that means you can maximizes potential and in my personal life as well so there's a lot of biohacking specifically thinking through how you optimize your energy levels all of these things like that so you know as i as i grow older it's, it's nice to just have a new lens at you know the, the human body and 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 life and just think through how can i optimize and be at my best so i'm really enjoying that and then you know, it's a it's a it's a no brainer kind of uh, you know the, the the mobile phone as a technology just on on it's it's especially with remote right now it's kind of like how can you optimize how people communicate but also in a healthy way as well so just what that looks like and all of the complexities of that that's really fascinating to me right now so you know the the human body from a bio technology point of view and then the most ubiquitous um, piece of technology out there right now the, the mobile phone. And I'm an Android person, yeah. So, okay. so, so I get okay. to tweak it a lot, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Awesome. So our next question, and I'm excited to hear your answer because you've lived all over, uh, you know, with Nigeria and the UK and the States. What has blown your mind? What, whether it's, you know, like Reed said, your personal life, your work life, something as you were growing up, what, what has blown your mind? 
Yeah, I, I have a point, I think, which should tie everything kind of together. Um, and so we're looking at it from the lens of technology, computer vision, biotechnology as well. And I don't know if, if you know this, the, the way the human vision works. You know, most people have like three cones in, in their eyes that you use to detect colors, RBG. Some people can actually see, and this goes to, to um, our realities. There's no objective, it's all kind of subjective because what we do is we filter through our senses. Some people can see, we know that they can see more colors or different colors because we know that they have, you know, four cones rather than the three. And I think it's 12% of people in the world. And I've met some, a group of people in a remote location where, you know, they could see things that I couldn't see, or they were using different vocabulary to see things that I couldn't see, which is really, really interesting. No, you know, um, so, so, the, and that's bad, you know, that's validated by science now, just the more we're learning about the human body, the more we see, you know, some of the differences that make us amazing and how much we can learn from each other as well. So that's a pretty cool one for me. Yeah, that's really it's cool. It is, it is very, uh, it's very eye-opening. Well, Silas. Yeah, no, no pun intended there. Yeah, no, no I know. Pun oh, come on, pun intended. I'm right? rolling my eyes there. Oh, wow. We're going to keep going on this? I see I'm what done. you're doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Silas, that, that, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for being on the show and dropping some knowledge on us. And I encourage our uh, listeners to go out and check out Reach Industries. They're a really cool startup. There's, you know, and just get out there and share ideas and uh, continue to innovate. So thanks for your time today, Silas. Thank you for joining the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US. If you enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe to our feed or explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media.